Hello. Can you guys hear me? Also, am I in focus? We've been trying to make sure I'm in focus. There's so much going on in the background, but I think that I am. Do I look in focus to you? Yeah. It's just because no camera. Okay. Hello. Get your jingle on. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Hi, everybody. Oh, you know what I forgot to grab is the tablet. I had it right there. Put it on the charger. I could go, oh, good, Nick. I'm glad you were able to make it, even though you forgot. It did sneak up on us because we're doing it a lot earlier than usual. We got Santa back here bringing gifts. Okay. Hello, hello. Yes, Mo, you made it. Okay, you guys, while we wait for some people to join in, um, I want to hear about either your favorite thing about the holidays or your least favorite thing about the holidays or both. While we wait for some people to join in. Uh, thank you so much, Nix. Thank you. You know, um, it's probably because like I have my hair straightened for the first time in so long. But um, honestly, it's time for, for me to go back. It needs a wash. I'm like, you know, when you start pulling it up into different styles, it's is because it doesn't look good down anymore. Hello, thank you. We're really big into Christmas decor around here. I would say my husband and Dosi is actually more into it than I am. But yeah, he's got the outside lights and we've got we've added a Christmas tree to our bedroom this year. So, we're definitely getting very very into the spirit this year. Favorite thing is hot chocolate and matching PJs. Oh, Ebony, I love that. We did matching PJs with our uh, whole immediate family last year, and that was a lot of fun. Um, and usually, and Dosi and I have some semblance of matching PJs. I don't think we bought anything this year, though. Mm -hmm. No, we haven't. I don't know if we will, because last year, or no, two years ago, I wanted to do it, and they were all sold out. Um, I was bending your videos earlier. I'm about to start my internship in MFT, in MFT. Congratulations, Robin. That is awesome. I've actually been hearing that more and more from people um, that they are starting to study marriage and family therapy. And a lot of people are watching my older videos because for those of you who don't know, I actually started my channel with um, doing breakdowns of MFT models, merger family therapy models for who, those who don't know what MFT stands for. And that's what my channel was dedicated to were for emerging, emerging therapists. And then after a while, I ended up doing content that was a little bit more universal and I, I've kind of stayed here, but I do need to get back to it. Okay, favorite thing is time off from work, spend time with the family and fuzzy socks. Yes, I love all of those things. I'm actually not taking any time off from work. I get Christmas Eve observed and Christmas Day off and I get New Year's Eve observed and New Year's Day off, but I'm not taking any other time off just because uh, I just feel like I've already used so much PTO and like so many of my clients have been hit with me needing to do other things that I'm like, I'm just going to work through the holidays because we have a vacation coming up in January. Okay. Favorite things is the favorite thing is having the kids home. Oh, I love that. How old are your kids, Robin? Um, mm -mm -mm. Favorite thing, the lights and cozy things, least fave, how performative people feel pressured to behave feels less genuine sometimes. That's fair, Mo. Definitely. I mean, especially to me when you're opening gifts and the expectation of how we're going to respond to those gifts, that pressure really overwhelms me. And sometimes at night, I just start thinking about that the night before Christmas, and I get overwhelmed. Um, there's definitely a performative element. That's why I think for me, I've been trying to make sure that I establish some boundaries around the holidays. And um, I'm meeting with smaller, smaller groups of people each year, just because by no fault of theirs, you know, I start feeling this overwhelming sense of needing to perform and do things that people would expect from me on the holidays. So I'm definitely aware of the performance element and trying to do what I can to get around that, circumvent that, and have as genuine experience as possible. Okay. I can't stay, but I'm glad I could pop in and give a like. Love this book and can't wait to hear your review. Time to decorate for Christmas with my little one. Okay. Another somebody. I hope you and your little one have a great time decorating. And thank you for popping in. Let you know, Make sure to leave a comment to let us know what you thought about the book. Okay, you guys. So let's jump into... 
what would you say? Um, yeah, you can, but the only thing about that is you can't go up to five, so it's always kind of like, yeah, I guess that's fair, yeah. Okay, so Nosi's gonna add um, in uh, something so you can vote rate what you rated this book. For me, this was one of the few books that I rated five stars. I actually read this for the first time ever last year. I've still never seen the movie. I always get nervous about movie adaptations. Y'all tell me if the movie adaptation stands up to the book. I absolutely loved this book so much. Um, and I thought that I didn't even realize what type of book I was reading until, you know, you get to the very end. Heads up, there will be spoilers in here. We're going to be talking about the ending of this book. I'll be referencing it throughout. So if you haven't read it or you haven't seen the movie and you don't want to know how it ends, that's okay. You know, finish it and you can come back and watch the live play later. Okay, so let's get into this. So um, for those of you who don't know, we are reading The Perks of Being a Wallflower, um, this book here. There we go. Hope you guys can see that okay. I know we've got like a little bit of a reflection going. There we go. So you guys can see my kitchen lights back there and Dosi just installed those. They're so nice. Um, but the perks of being a wallflower. Oh, you know what? I know how to do that. See, my thing is I always have my brightness down so low. There we go. Now I can adjust to it, I think. It's probably too bright. You guys get the picture. The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Probably saw it in the thumbnail. This is the cover um, that does not have the actors on there, which is my preference. Okay, you said your kids are all in their 20s. It's so nice to see them get along as adults. Yeah, I feel like um, I'm so looking forward to the whole building our family part of life. And I'm looking even already forward to like the years of seeing who my kids end up dating and becoming a grandparent and things like that. With As a person who studies the family life cycle, I just think that um, it's so exciting to think about living that all the way through. So I want to go ahead and jump in. First, I want to give a shout out. I don't know if Sierra is already in here. Probably not because she normally would comment, but Sierra um, Livermore, she is one of our OG book club members. And she, I think, was one of the main people who suggested that we read this book um, this for this month. And that was a great idea. And she also left an amazing review on it. She does great reviews. So if you're on Goodreads, if you find her, I'm usually interacting with her. So if you're following or, friend, or friends with me, you'll find her. But she left an amazing review that I'll probably be referencing a lot because I like how she organized it. And it kind of helps us kind of break it down into... Um, nice bite-sized chunks um, of what topics to focus on. So the first thing I wanted to ask you guys is your thoughts about the format of the book. So this book, for those of you who don't know, it's written in the format of letters to an unknown recipient. And I wanted to know how you all felt about that format. Did you find it distracting? Did you find it limiting? Did you find it cr to be creative, helpful? I really want to know what were your initial reactions? And like I said, I haven't watched the movie, but I imagine that there's some sort of indication of that whole letter writing element. I mean, I feel like they've really missing out a lot of how the story is told without it. Um, but let me know what you thought about that format of the book being told through letters. Okay, so let's see what you guys are saying. Okay, yeah, and this is gonna go ahead and end the poll on what everyone rated it. Wow, 86% of our voters said that it was a five-star read for them and everybody else said it was a four-star. So anyone who read this book pretty much enjoyed it that's in this live. Um, and you guys feel free to re respond to each other in the chat too. If I miss something, I'm always open to you all um, responding to each other. Okay, so Nick said, I really liked it, to be honest. Reading it was like a friend writing me letters and trusting me so much. It's a cool feeling. You know, I really, really loved the format, too. It was one of the first times that I'd seen an entire story told that way. Um, since then, I have read some stories that have been told that way, but 
I absolutely loved the way that this book was told through letters. Um, now, I will say, if you got read the 20th edition, uh, 20th anniversary edition, at the end, they do a, a letter from a grown version of Charlie. He's an adult now and, and kind of doing like a motivational speech. Um, I personally did not care for that. I didn't think that was necessary, especially since he doesn't reveal who he's writing the letters to. I felt if he was going to reveal who he wrote the letters to, then that would be, a, I would love to have some sort of closure about that. But because he doesn't, um, I just felt like it was unnecessary and I didn't really need it. But I know why they were doing it just as a way of um, thanking the, the viewers and the readers who have seen the movie, who've read the books, thanking them for just loving the story and sharing it. But yeah, I also really, really loved the format of it being a letter. So I want to jump into some questions about the story itself. First, I wanted to know from you guys that have read the book, what would you say is your impression about Charlie being a, wall, a wall, wallflower? And for those of you who don't know what that means, Charlie is described by multiple character, characters in the book, and we can see even the way he's telling his own story, that he pretty much stands uh, to the side and watches life happen around him. He doesn't really take, um, a take agency of his own life or have autonomy even of his own body. And so now we find out in the end a little bit more about why, but I'm curious as you're reading it or even if you're watching the movie, what do you make of that? Did you think of this as you're originally reading it as a positive quality or a negative quality? Did you identify with that at all? Um, have any of you ever felt like a wallflower? For me, I would say that um, I thought that at first I thought it was really endearing because they kind of talk about it in a positive way. I remember, I think it's Patrick or Brad, somebody says to him that essentially what they love about him is that he's so observant. And because of that, like when they um, were doing Christmas gifts and things like that, he got everyone the perfect gift because he paid such close attention to everyone. Um, and that is a benefit for sure of being a wallflower, of being observant, is that you typically know what other people's needs are. And I thought that was sweet. I think my favorite trope or theme that we see in this book is the found family element. You know, for those of you who aren't familiar with the story, Charlie's going to high school for the first time. And his home life, if you're a therapist looking at that home life, that seems like the exact opposite of an enmeshed family. They seem to have pretty rigid boundaries in their family and that Charlie is clearly not feeling loved. Um, and it shows, right? So when he goes to high school, there are there's a group of older kids who kind of take him under their wing. And I think because he feels that sense of community, it makes him essentially do whatever they want him to do because he just wants to be included and to have a place where he feels like he belongs. He talks about at the beginning when it comes to his sister, for example, she said to him um, that she hates him. And she, he goes, it's not like how it is when she says it to my dad. When she says she hates me, she truly means it. He feels in his own home like he is not loved. And that was something that I thought was very eye-opening into why he was so devoted to this group of people that he started connecting with. Let me see what you said, I.L. Hedden. I love how thoughtful Charlie was throughout the novel. Even when we learn what happened to him, he stands up for people he loves. Absolutely, I agree. I still think that, you know, there's a lot of critiques around um, Charlie's writing style through this book, because he writes what people think to, in a way where he's like not as advanced as he should be for his age being in ninth grade. And a lot of people do tie that to his trauma because he, for those of you who don't know, and there's a trigger warning here, we'll be talking about SA. If that's too much for you, take care of yourself and it's okay. We'll see you next time. 
But Charlie was molested by his aunt. That's what was revealed at the end of the book. And because of that, was one thing that we'll see with trauma a lot of times is regression or stunted growth. And so I think that it does make sense. And even Sierra talked about this in her review, um, that Charlie never really developed past the time of being abused by his aunt. And a lot of the love cues he experiences from his friends, he compares them to his aunt. There are two moments that really stood out to me. Um, he had someone say to him that they love you, they love him. And it, I think it was Sam actually. Sam is a person that he develops a really huge crush on and they have kind of a complicated, weird relationship, but I thought of it as somewhat endearing too, but there is a bit of an age difference there. But um, Sam told him that she loves him. And he even says, even though I knew she meant it platonically, that's the first time I ever heard that since my aunt died. So it meant so much to me. So this is what happens a lot of times when children are not experiencing love and affection and attention in their home. They go out into the world, and when they are experiencing those things from other people, even if they're, those things are paired with abuse, such as the way that they were in this case, they can't make sense of, oh, just because a person is giving me candy, for example, doesn't mean they should be allowed to touch me however they want to, for example, right? So here, Charlie is holding on to whatever will make him feel a sense of love. And he talks about that even later on when someone says that he's special. He says that's the first time he'd heard that since his Aunt Helen passed away. So really, I don't know about you all. Let me know. Did you know that or did you realize through the course of the book that Aunt Helen was um, an abuser of Charlie? I, I, I'll be honest, I did not see that coming. I really thought that this was a story about grief. You know, I thought that Charlie had this family member who was so kind to him that passed away, the only family member that he felt truly loved by. Now, he, he loves his family, but his family is very disconnected, as I said. They're very disjointed. He even says at one point when he's trying to get a, a gift for his dad, he said that... Um, he wants to get his dad a gift because he loves him, but he doesn't know him, right? So even for somebody who pays attention to people, he still felt in the dark when it came to his own family members, right? So for Charlie, it, it definitely seemed like with Aunt Helen, I thought she represented just a loving presence for him that he missed and that this found family was kind of picking up the pieces for him. But when that reveal happened at the end, you look at the story totally differently and it started making so much sense. Reasons why it's not as obvious is because it's portrayed in a way that we don't typically see. We don't always see a female perpetrator with a young male victim or survivor. And so for a lot of us, it's just not the first thing that comes to our mind. If this story was told the other way around where you had a young girl who was in high school and talking about her uncle who was always giving her treats and she's sitting on his lap and things like that, we probably would have more alarm bells going off. And so the way the story is told, it's not really obvious, at least it wasn't to me, that, that was going to be the ending, but what a strong ending because it really shows um, the impact of trauma, especially trauma that happens at a young age, we really like to think of children as just being super resilient. We always say that kids are resilient. And in the book, What Happened to You um, about trauma, we read that in the book club earlier this year. Um, Dr. Perry talks about how a lot of times we say children are resilient because it makes us feel better about the trauma that we're putting them through. And we don't really want to deal with the ramifications of what we're doing to kids, right? So we'll say, oh, they'll deal with it. Time heals all wounds. Kids are really resilient. Or we'll even think they're ignorant enough not to realize the impact of things. But kids are aware. They can perceive uh changes and dynamics. They can perceive depression, anxiety, things like that. And they're more aware than we think. And when something happens to a child, the best thing you can do is find support for them, especially if the parent is involved in the trauma. Let's say it's a divorce. For example, it's good to get your kid involved with some sort of professional, right? 
a therapist, a play therapist. I even have some clients who have been able to use equestrian therapy where a kid is bonding, connecting with a horse in order to kind of express their emotions. That is what is recommended because we often overlook the, ex the negative experiences of children under the guise that they are so resilient so that we can embrace ourselves and um, really protect our own ego from the amount of damage that we can do to children. I did not see it coming at all. I thought it was about Michael and Helen dying. Yeah, Mary, it was, I'm glad to see that I wasn't the only person. That was definitely a, a big shocker for me to read that. I did not see it coming at all. I mean, I remember being glued, you know, I read on a Kindle. I was glued to that Kindle and I was reading so quickly. I think I finished this book it may be a couple of days, and I'm not a fast reader, but it was that engaging of a read for me. Let's see. I was super confused about the ending with Aunt Helen. I had to ask my mom because I was so young. I didn't know about sexual assault. I thought it was about grief, too. I'm really curious, Nix, how your mom handled that conversation with you. Do you feel like she handled it in a way where being younger, you were able to understand and process it without internalizing it? Um, I think it'd be good for anybody in here who might have to have similar conversations with their kids in the future. Um, I.L. Hedden said, I also didn't see it coming and had to be very careful when discussing this revelation with my high school students because I didn't want to trigger anyone accidentally. Right. You know, that's actually one of the reasons why we, it's been so long before we even read this book in the book club. Sometimes I honestly get so nervous about being able to talk about things in a way that's not going to, going to be overwhelming to you all, especially for really sensitive topics. Um, but since this recommendation came from some people in the book club, I assumed that that meant that it would probably be okay for this group. But I can only imagine when, you know, talking with high school students, the level of sensitivity you have to have, I really commend you for that. Guadalupe, hi, it's good to see you. I know that you've been in our lives before. I didn't get to read the book. I watched the movie as a teen, though. I just remember Emma Watson struggling and then working hard to get to Penn State. Yeah, you know, I really have to watch this movie because when I imagined Sam, she looked nothing like Emma Watson. And I actually didn't see the movie cover until after I finished the book. So my view on how all the characters look is so different from how they were casted in the movie. I can't imagine Emma Watson as Sam. Like, I just, I can't. The way that she's described in the book just to me seems like such, so much more of a rebellious character than what I imagined for Emma. And it's not fair because obviously I still see Emma as Hermione um, forever and that's not fair to her. So I def definitely need to watch the movie and I might even do, um, like I did with Twilight, like a breakdown between the book and the movie and looking at the relational dynamics and how they play out. Um, I like that perspective about us assuming resili resiliency in children. I've never thought of it that way. Yeah, I actually hadn't either. So it was nice to see because Dr. Bruce Perry, who um, partnered with Oprah on the book, What Happened to You? He actually works specifically on trauma and specifically his population that he works with our children. So I really, really valued what he had to say about the way that we, the narrative that we use to comfort ourselves when it comes to trauma with children. I highly recommend that book. If you didn't read that with us for the book club, you could read it on your own. And like I said, these uh, lives are always available on demand if you want to come back and, and watch that to see what we were all thinking at the time. I think that was a great book for anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about trauma. Um, Mo, I also only watched the movie. I still need to watch the movie. Emma doing an American accent had me shook. Was her American accent good? I feel like I pride myself on being able to see that somebody is trying to do an American accent. So I'm curious how good she did her accent. Usually I'm able to, I'm like, hold on, this person sounds like they might be Australian, like a word or two may give them away. Um, and so in her case, obviously it's going to be hard for me to not hear uh, the accent that she uses as Hermione, her, her natural accent. Let's see, um, Nick said, my mom was pretty direct about it. She kind she kind of went about it slowly and explaining it to me. She didn't say a lot, honestly, just that she inappropriately touched Charlie and I had to ask questions. So how old were you, Nix, when you read this book? I'm curious. Because I, I think obviously that makes a big difference in like how your mom is going to communicate with you about sexual assault. 
Guadalupe, yes, that'd be great. A video similar to your breakdown of Twilight series would be great. Okay, thank you. Good to know that you'd be interested in that. I really honestly never know. After I get done with the series, I'm so lost when it comes to what content to do next. So I really value um, all of the, the suggestions you guys have or questions you ask me. That helps me out a lot. Um, let's see. So Nick said, my mom just kept slowly and carefully explaining what it was and how it was wrong. I was in the I was in middle school and I remember feeling super sad about it, but feeling disconnected because I hadn't experienced it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's one of those few times where feeling a feeling of disconnection with that. Um, you know, I'm glad that you weren't able to connect with that part of the story. Um, I don't remember. I saw it when it first came out and um, since because of all the sensitive topics and not because of all the sensitive topics. Okay. So let's see, let's go on to some more of the notes that I have. Oh, I thought this was an interesting highlight. Now, if you are new to my book clubs, I kind of go all over the place. Basically there's a quote or anything that stands out to me. I, I kind of like to just talk about what you guys thought about this quote. If you think it's true, things like that. So on page 23, Charlie says, the thing is some girls think they can actually change guys. And what's funny is if is that if they actually did change them, they'd get bored. Let me read that again since I messed up. The thing is some girls think that they can actually change guys. And what's funny is that if they actually did change them, they'd get bored. What do you guys think about that? I personally think that is so true. I mean, I know a lot of people say that they are looking for a good relationship and a stable partner. But what I see a lot of times as a therapist is that when people do find those securely attached, stable partners, they end up feeling so bored because like we read, <laughs> I, this is going to end up turning into a bunch of plugs about other books we've read in the book club. So I'm so sorry about that, but I really do reference these books so much in my work. But another book that we read at the very beginning of this year is Attached, um, which talks about dating and attachment styles. And he talks about how a lot of people, once they get to a certain stage with dating a person who is securely attached and not easily um, their attachment is not easily disrupted or triggered. People get bored because they associate passion and chemistry with sparks. And for a lot of people, sparks is like that up and down of the attachment wounds. You know, I'm afraid this person doesn't really like me. That's why people play games because those power imbalances a lot of times are effective for us to get a person's attention. So I absolutely do believe that if people, a lot of people are also so motivated in a relationship to change someone that that is essentially what their entire life mission becomes. It's like, I'm going to help this guy get the perfect job and he's going to make up with all of his family members that he's not, hasn't been talking to. And I'm going to help him start dressing better and eating better and all of these things that they think they're going to do. And if all those things happen, mission accomplished. Now, what's your purpose in life now? You've dedicated so many years to building this person up, most of the time neglecting our own needs and our own wants, ambitions, desires. And once that person is exactly what you wanted them to be all along, you know, there's a major shift in the dynamic. And honestly, a lot of times they end up finding somebody else that they think is more on their level now that they've upgraded. So I'm really curious what you guys think about that. Let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Wait, wait, wait. A great analysis would be of the Eleanor Oliphant book. That is honestly one of my favorite books ever. Definitely a five-star read. That would be a great idea. I'm going to add that because I'm trying to keep a list of um, ideas for us to vote on. As a matter of fact, while you guys are in here, let's get the poll going. Should we do a memoir? A psychology book, like the ones that I, I'm referencing, it could be attachment, it could be about trauma, it could be about grief. Um, or should we do a fiction book like this, a novel that kind of inspires us to talk about some of these mental health topics? We'll go ahead and get that going in the chat. And I have some suggestions. That's a great one. Um, Eleanor Oliphant, I'll put that in the fiction section. Um, what we'll do is we'll do 
first round voting for a type of book, second round voting for exactly which book within that genre. So if you have other suggestions, feel free to pop that in the chat too so we can um, add it to our list to vote on. Memoir, psychology book, or novel. So novel, you can put in parentheses, fiction. And this is for the next book. Yeah, this is for our next book. Our next meeting will be in February. Okay, so let's see what you guys are saying. Mm -mm -mm. It wasn't that great of a book, in my opinion, but her thought process and breakdown of trauma would be interesting and informative. Guadalupe, you didn't think it was a great book? I love that book so much. I'm curious, what didn't you like about it? Okay, hey, Robin, you want some sort of push and pull in a relationship, a challenge. Yeah. Are you saying that you should want that, the push and pull, or do you think that people naturally want that push and pull? I want to know if you're saying that that's what you want and that's what you should want. Mary says, I think Charlie's actually very insightful throughout the book. And that's one of the times he's so right. He is so, so insightful. And I think that's why for a lot of us, the trauma element was completely overlooked. And this is what happens in real life, right? Even in therapy, this can happen. You have a client who's really insightful, who has a really strong understanding of mental health, coping skills, pe person whose relationships seem to thrive very, very well, they're very loving, and their trauma completely goes unnoticed for a long time. As a matter of fact, when I first started practicing, I started practicing um, around the time the Me Too movement was coming about, when it was really at its getting to its peak. And people I've been working with for a long time, all of a sudden, started sharing with me their stories of sexual assault. And it's because it was so persistent in the media, they just couldn't escape those memories or thoughts and they were connecting things that we've been talking about for so long in therapy with those past experiences. So I definitely think that just as a lot of us missed it in the book, it's so easy to miss it with our closest friends, family members, even with ourselves, you know, even in therapy, it can be one of those things that we just don't think about and don't talk about. So that's something I've tried to get better in the habit of assessing at the beginning, you know, it was really, really asking, even if I already asked five times before, do you think there are any traumatic events that could help us understand this behavior, this choice, et cetera? So let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, throw a log on. We got the fire going. You guys, if you were in my last live, the Hunger Games live, we were trying to get that fire going for so long and it just honestly kept going up going down that's why today's fire i got that bad boy started two hours ago so that we would have a consistent flame sorry that's our alarm okay so let's see i think that's true oh and let me let me tell you guys some of the books that i'm considering so far in each section um so that as you're voting, you know, you can change your vote if you specifically want to read one of these books. So some of the suggestions we've gotten from book club members in the memoir section um, are is Friends, Lovers, Big Terrible Things by Matthew Perry, Rest in Peace. Um, some people were interested in reading about his story because he does deal with addiction and mental health struggles in that book. So that might be something that would be um, good to talk about. Uh, the Britney Spears memoir that just came out last year, um, The Woman and Me, I have already finished that one. And I would say that one might be good to talk about in terms of uh, difficult family dynamics. Um, that might be an interesting one for us to think through, talk about. Um, Crying in H Mart, five-star read for me. That's probably my favorite read of this year. Um, that one is talking a lot about grief. Um, so that book is about um, someone losing their mother and kind of talking about what their experience was like with their mother when she was dealing with the terminal illness and things like that. Um, I thought that that was a beautiful book. And I think that she incorporates food into the story. So, I mean, that, that book, it just, it's, it's, it's one of those ones that just sits with me. It's become a, such an important part of how I look at literature. I think that was an amazing book. 
And then I think I'm glad my mom died would be a great book for us. Um, she talks about, for anyone who's not familiar, this is written by Jeanette McCurdy. And she talks about being a child star. She also talks about eating disorders and dealing with a narcissistic mother. So there's a lot for us to talk about with that book. Psychology books I'm looking at, I'm currently reading a book called The Good Life. This book is really interesting. It's looking at the longest ever study of happiness an 84 year studies um, by Harvard. And it's looking at what their, what their findings are doing interviews over the course of 84 years, multiple generations um, and getting answers about what are the most important factors for people for happiness. I found that book, I'm finding that book to be really interesting. Um, if you guys have other psychology recommendations you'd like us to look at, and psychology really could be books about relationships, books about uh, family, books about trauma, books about uh, grief, books about a specific diagnosis. We've had somebody in the book club um, who's written a book on schizophrenia, for example. So psychology just means anything that is nonfiction and a mental health specific topic. And then right now in the fiction, let's see, we've got Eleanor Oliphant. If you have other ideas, you guys go ahead and pop that in. I mean, we could do Catching Fire. I know we did Hunger Games, but I just kind of don't want to like make every book in the book club like the same series because I think that could get boring. But, you know, I am really ready to start Catching Fire. And a lot of people are, uh, my friends are about to start it. So if you guys are interested in that for fiction too, we could. So let me read through a few more of your um, comments. You guys have the chat on fire. I love reading what you're writing. So keep it going. And like I said, feel free to respond to each other if you want. Um, do, 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 uh, I think that's true why they got attracted to that person. Exactly. People get attracted to a broken person a lot of times. And that healed version of that person is not as attractive. Actually, I see that a lot of times in therapy. One of the first things I'll warn people about in individual therapy is as you go through your growth process and you start healing and you start establishing boundaries, some of your relationships will suffer. Brace yourself for that. Be prepared for that. There will be people who look at therapy as the enemy because they're recognizing that you're changing since you've been going to therapy. And they view that change as a negative change because most of the time it negatively impacts them, not you, right? So I agree, you know, healing or evolving in any way can definitely impact our relationships, including a dating relationship. Let's see, as someone who very much experienced this a lot with trying to help and fix people, and I just get so tired and bored in a way because I wanted to save people because no one knew about my problems and internalizing it. My BPD, for those who don't know, BPD can stand usually either for bipolar personality disorder or for borderline personality disorder. Um, also really came into play with it as well. I'm assuming you mean borderline, Nix, um, but you can clarify below if you don't. Okay, let's see. Ariel said, I love a memoir. I'm really, I've really been into memoirs um, too. I used to not really be that into memoirs, but even back in college, one of the first books I really sat there and just read for, for leisure, because you know, in college, everything you're reading is assigned reading. But one of the books I really sat there and read for leisure was Barry Gordy's um, autobiography. Barry Gordy is the founder of Motown, for anyone who doesn't know. That was an amazing memoir. So, well, that's an autobiography. There's a difference between a memoir and an autobiography for anyone who doesn't know. Memoirs are usually just pulling at specific memories and expanding on them in hopes of painting a picture of what this person's life what they were like, what their life was like. And autobiography usually is going to go from like the beginning of life all the way up until the point of where the person is now, um, a little bit more chronologically and not necessarily just emphasizing small snippets to paint a larger picture. I think a memoir, personally, I think a memoir is probably a little easier to write than an autobiography because with autobiographies, I'm always like, how do you remember all this detail? Like, if I try to do that about my life, like I could not remember all that detail. So it does often require a lot more documentation and things like that to try to look and get your facts correct and things like that. Literally my favorite book ever is A Piece of Cake by Cupcake Brown, highly recommend. Oh, I've actually never heard of that. So I'm going to add that to my list of things to look into. Maybe that's something that we could vote on in our next one. Like I said, a, can you write that down for me, babe? What? Um, that book, A Piece of Cake by Cupcake Brown. 
Okay, we're going to need more uh, wine by Gabriel Union for memoir. Really? Actually, I've been hearing, let me see, what is the review, what is the rating for that one on Goodreads? I don't think, I don't think I've seen great reviews for that one. I see you've got anything stronger. Is it a new one that's coming out? We're going to need more wine. You know what? That's probably a sequel for You Got Anything Stronger, which actually has great reviews, 4.13. Maybe I'm getting her confused with um, another book. Okay, so let me see. Maybe that, that one you're talking about is going to come out. We're going to need more wine. Oh, uh-uh. That came out in 2017. Also has pretty good um, rating. That's an older book. Hmm. Okay. So I will check that one out. I'm trying to get better about like reading the books before I do them for the book club because I think it makes it easier for me to be able to vouch for a book when <laughs> I've already read it. I used to, do, used to do it more for accountability. Like I need to read these books. So I need a friend to read it with me. But I think we end up having like a lot of books that I don't like or you guys don't like when we do it that way. I probably still will sometimes do that, but I'm, I'm more moving away from that. Uh, Denia said, I'm reading Crying in HMR and bruh, I just keep crying. It's so great. It's so great. That book is so good. I literally found myself crying during the acknowledgement. First of all, even reading those and then crying during them. I just loved it. Her storytelling abilities are impeccable and she's just such an honest narrator, like nobody's safe. And I love that. Let's see. I'm sorry. I just didn't like her attitude. It was a few years back. I read it. I loved her growth, though, about Eleanor Oliphant, Guadalupe. I can understand that. She was like a little pretentious, but I <laughs> I just love the way she looked at the world. Like a lot of the stuff she was saying, I'm like, that does make sense. Why do we do that? OK, the fire is thriving. Yes, it is. It is. We love a good fire here. We go this fireplace starting in October all the way up until March here in Atlanta. That's we use that thing every single day. Um, mm, mm, mm. Hey, Rachel. OK, so let's see. The fire is starting. The Britney Spears book. I just finished the audio book. OK, yeah, I just finished it, too. Really good. Really good. Now, I will say I have my doubts that Britney really sat down and typed that just based on like how she presents herself on Instagram, but she does kind of leave it open at the end to say that we'll never really know which one is the real her. So, but I do kind of have my doubts, but it was a really good book. Okay. I love, I'm glad my mom died. I love that too. I binged that in one weekend, maybe even like less than a day. Why do you think a lot of the parents of young celebrities who grow up famous seem to have narcissistic qualities like Jeanette's mom and Britney's parents? I mean, I, to me, the narcissism is probably what makes them push their kids into the spotlight in the first place. Like they might not have the looks or the talent to be out there, but now they can like mold this innocent being into living or fulfilling their dreams for them. So I think that the, what we're seeing is just a correlation between parents who want to put their kids out there so that they can have somewhat of a presence. And a lot of them make themselves the manager and things like that, even though more than likely your kid probably benefit from a more experienced manager, you know? Um, mm -mm. All right, let's see. My sister loved, I'm glad my mom died, but I haven't read it. It's been on my list. Yeah, the poll is going back and forth. It's probably as we're throwing out more examples, people are changing their mind and stuff. That's okay. We're going to keep that poll going for a little bit. Um, I haven't read, we're going to um, read more wine or this need more wine or the sequel. It's been on my reading list forever. Ashley, I feel the opposite. I really, the first one, I think we're going to need more wine, but didn't really enjoy. Do you have anything stronger? Okay. Gabriella. Hi, Gabriella. Acknowledgement sections. Some are so good. They can make me cry for sure. Especially when people start like doing the thing where they're talking about like their partner who had to deal with all of their crazy months of writing a book. I just imagine writing a book just takes so much energy, time, and just, you know, your relationship suffer. So I always think that that is the sweetest part for me. Um, I thought Britney's was confirmed as a ghostwriter. There is a ghostwriter, but like Adele also used the same ghostwriter that Britney used. So the question is always, to what extent did the celebrity 
actually sit down and come up with parts of the story. So a lot of them are really involved in that they pretty much might have their own manuscript with how they even got the rights, how their book even got published in the first place, right? Or how Publishing House found it. And then you have that ghostwriter come in and like really reorganize it, synthesize it, you know, get more out of them to make the story good. Then you have the other ones where you know, they might throw a few details in here or there, but the but that ghostwriter might be doing like a lot of outside research and interviews and such to tell a comprehensive story. I'm thinking Britney's story was more of the latter. Okay, let's see. The Kerry Washington memoir. I didn't even think about that one. You guys are throwing out some great Kerry Wash. I mean, some great memoir ideas. I forgot about that one. Now... That one and the Matthew Perry one are two that I haven't read, so I can't really vouch for them, but the Kerry Washington one was definitely on my list. Yeah, that's a good one. You guys, we will do a poll. So right now we are already up to five on the memoir section that we'll vote on. So if you have any ideas for the psychology books or fiction books, throw those in the chat because we can only put five in the poll. Okay. Shonda Rhimes. I did read Shonda Rhimes' book. It really, honestly, was not my favorite. It was pretty good, but it wasn't my favorite. Um, Self-Help Psychology Idea, How to Do the Work by Nicole LaPera. Okay, let me see what that one's about. We will get back to our book, but it is very important to me that we pick a book that we all are excited about. Um, how to do the work. Okay. The Holistic Psychologist. Okay, I'll read you guys a little bit of the synopsis. Dr. Nicole Apera often found herself frustrated by the limitations of traditional psychotherapy, wanting more for her patients and for herself. She began a journey to develop a united philosophy of mental, physical, and spiritual wellness that equips people with the interdisciplinary tools necessary to heal themselves. Okay. Okay, so I'll put that down here on the list. Thank you. How to do the work. Recognize your patterns, heal from your past, and create yourself. Okay, adding that to the list. Thank you for the suggestion. All right, so let's get to um, some more, a little bit more about the perks of being a wallflower. Keep it going. Keep it going because I really want to know what everybody thinks. I'll keep it going for another. We'll do a two-minute call on that poll. We're voting on if you want to read a memoir, if you want to read a psychology or self-help book, or if you want to do a fiction book, a novel, like we're doing this month. Okay, so let's see. All right, so we've got to talk about the big quote that comes from this book that everyone references. Um, definitely one of my personal highlights on page 24 when he says, we accept the love that we think we deserve. And I am a strong believer in that whenever I have clients or friends who are in relationships that to me are communicating that they are you know, having to fight hard to prove that they are lovable and worthy of affection, worthy of attention and being prioritized. It, it, I always have to take it back to, do you think this is a reflection of how much you love yourself? You know, based on how much you love yourself, how much would you say that your relationship is a reflection of that? OK, so I get a lot of mixed answers across the board. Um, I'll hear people actually say to me, my part. Oh, my partner loves me way more than I love myself. And that's what I love about them. And I'm like, OK, we're looking at this, that, this thing they did. OK, they cheated and they've been lying. And you're telling me those behaviors are showing you more love than the love that you have for yourself. We need to update the treatment plan, right? We need to talk about self-esteem, building self-worth. If those behaviors to you look more loving, I'm not only talking about when they bring you flowers, when they pick your kids up from school, I'm talking about looking at it from a whole perspective that those things that they're doing on a regular basis still 
look to you more like love than how you feel about yourself. So I absolutely thought that that was a, a quote that we accept the love we think we deserve. I mean, that I will, I'm, if I see a t-shirt with it, I'm buying it. If I see a mug with it, I'm buying it. That is just, it's such a true quote. So um, one of the things like I talked about before, when they're complimenting Charlie, somebody says to him, you see things, you keep quiet about them and you understand. So there's a balance to this, right? On one hand, it, it's so nice to be able to sit back and observe, you know, and to not always um, be in the center of a conversation, being able to really pay attention to the people you're around, what their interests are, things like that. But we need balance. There also needs to be times where you are speaking up, where you are the spectacle, you might want to say, the person that everyone else is paying attention to the person who is making jokes according to their sense of humor. So we see part of the reason why a lot of us love Charlie is because a lot of the trauma responses that he utilizes are also complimented and held on a pedestal. People are complimenting him for these things that are actually a sign of trauma. And Sam calls him out for that. Um, Sam says to him, <laughs> Where is this quote? I wanted to do a direct quote, but I might just have to. Yeah, it looks like I'm going to have to just um, think putting yourself last and doing whatever anybody else wants you to do is love. And how many of us think that? How many of us were raised to think that, socialized to think that, especially growing up in like a black Southern church, there is almost this idea that if you are not completely expending yourself for everyone around you, that you are a selfish, a bad person. You know, I come from like such a small church where like, I'm telling you every single day of the week, there could be an event. You have church events, you got rehearsals, you got this big thing coming up on Sunday, you got a funeral on Saturday. It's like so much and if you can't make it to something, the first thing you hear, I missed you. Where were you? The I missed you is really the where were you, you know? And so we're really socialized to put other people's needs above our own if we want to be seen as a good person. And so that is something that I definitely took away from this story is like remembering that it's okay to advocate for yourself. That doesn't make you a bad person. That doesn't make you a less lovable person that doesn't make you undeserving of close relationships and connections, you know, there's a balance. You want to show up for your friends. I don't like that we're in such a self-centered period of time where everybody is like, nobody wants to be there for anyone. Like, I can't tell you how many times I have new clients come to me and say the reason they're in therapy, like they might have the most basic of things that they're dealing with, and they're, the reason they're in therapy, not necessarily because they need answers, but because they have no one to talk to, because everyone is telling them that, you know, I don't have the energy to deal with all of the things you want to talk about. And, you know, sometimes that's fair. You know, every now and then we're just at our limit and we can't take anything more. But if that is your default, if by default you're not available to anyone, you're not helping anyone, I question the validity of the connections that you have. So I don't think we should be completely self-centered, but obviously we do need to advocate for ourselves when we're overwhelmed. And there is a, a very fine line. I know it's not easy to navigate or manage, but we have to allow ourselves the opportunity to, to recoup our energy and our resources in order to be our best for others and for ourselves, not just for others, but for others and for ourselves. Okay, let's see. Oh, I thought this was a great example of a coping skill that Charlie that Charlie used. So I wanted to share this. He said, I try to remind myself when I feel great like this, that there will be another terrible week coming someday. 
So I should store up as many great details as I can. So during the next terrible week, I can remember those details and believe that I'll feel great again. That is an amazing coping skill. Absolutely something that I use with clients all the time. You know, I might have a client who has been coming to me for months and they are saying, you know, they're despondent, they're depressed, they're suicidal, they don't want to get out of bed. Then they might come to me, you know, after we've been working for a little while, or maybe it has nothing to do with therapy, just things happening in outside life. And they're actually excited again. Maybe they had a great date or they got a good, a great job, or they just, nothing changed, but they're just feeling better. I say, even though nobody wants to think about the fact that once again, they may feel low, because that's something they'll say to me is like, I don't want to get too excited about this because I know I'm probably going to get depressed again. And I say, and it goes the other way around too, right? If you get depressed again, you know that you'll get back to a point like this too. It's cyclical. None of us are always happy and none of us are always, always, always sad. Even if we spend our majority of our time that way, we still have glimpses of happiness. So what we'll do is I'll have them in therapy, we'll write out the details of how they're feeling right now and some of their favorite aspects of these moments, right? They might say things like, it feels great to be running again. It feels awesome to like how I look in my clothes, but they might just describe the feeling itself. Like when I wake up in the morning, I'm okay getting out of bed. I'm not sad at the idea of having to get up and face the world, right? So just to remember, there was a point in time where you felt that way before. And even if you get back to a low period again, you can get back to feeling happy again. That's just as possible. That I think is a really important coping skill is to know it is cyclical. So just as you're so confident when you're happy that you'll one day feel sad again, when you're sad, try to remember that you'll more than likely feel happy again at some point too. And I think that shortens how long it takes us to get there when we have the belief that it is possible. Okay, we're going to close this poll. Okay. So what one? A novel. A novel one. Okay. It was so close. And you know what? We already did this poll on Goodreads and it all a novel also won there. All right, guys. So now I want you to start sharing. Hi, Sierra. You are late, but you were already here in heart because I've already told them about your amazing review and I've been kind of referencing some of the things that you talked about as well. So good to have you here. Um, okay, so... We have just voted on reading a, another novel for our next book club. It was a really tight vote, right? Like, I mean, everything is in the 30% range. Um, so what novels are you all most interested in reading? Right now, I have Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. Um, I can read you guys the synopsis of that book as you think of other ideas that you may want to read. I love that book. Um, this is a book that I think it really, to me, um, this character demonstrates kind of the thought process of what it is for someone who's a little bit um, on the spectrum. I would say a little moderate to, in between moderate and severe on the spectrum. And because of that, I think it's really interesting to see the way she sees the world. Um, and it's just, I thought that it was an excellent book. I personally read this one. I didn't listen to the audiobook, so I may give the audiobook a listen for our book club if we are to choose this one. So let me read. Oh, wow. Oh, that's about the author. I'm like, they don't have a um, thing. Okay, here we go. Meet Eleanor Oliphant. She struggles with appropriate social skills and tends to say exactly what she's thinking. Nothing is missing in her carefully timetabled life of avoiding social interactions, where weekends are punctuated by frozen pizza, vodka, and phone chats with mommy. But everything changes when Eleanor meets Raymond, 
the bubbling and deeply unhygienic IT guy from her office. When she and Raymond together save Sammy, an elderly gentleman who has fallen on the sidewalk, the three become the kinds of friends who rescue one another from the lives of isolation they have each been living. And it is Raymond's big heart that will ultimately help Eleanor find the way to repair her own profoundly damaged one. So that, I mean, it, I wouldn't classify this as a romance, even though it kind of sounds like that. I personally would not classify it as a, a romance. It's definitely adult fiction. I um, mean, the mental health themes are significantly stronger than a the romance themes. That was an awesome suggestion, Guadalupe. Thank you for that. Um, let me see what else you guys are suggesting in here. Do, do, do. You guys have this chat going on fire. Oh, where I get the shirt from? H&M. Whenever we're about to go on a trip and I'm like, I need some new clothes. I probably got this for like $10, honestly. I go to H&M. Sam? In the book? Yeah, so Sam is is his crush. What do I think about her? Um, You know, I thought that Sam kind of, to me, she kind of represented like the maternal figure of the friend group. Um, she was always so sweet to Charlie. And the thing about them is with the age difference and like the crush and the things that end up playing out with them, you know, after we find out what happened with him and his aunt, it kind of almost felt like, were we watching this kind of play out again on a smaller scale? Um, obviously, Sam didn't know that, what, what happened with him. But I thought I liked... Everybody in his friend group, I liked, um, even though in a way, even Patrick kind of assaulted him, you know, Patrick kissed him and he didn't, he didn't say no, but he didn't want to kiss from Patrick. He was just letting Patrick use his body in whatever way he needed to, to feel better after he was feeling down and depressed, I think from a breakup with Brad. So <sighs> those relationships, they told the line in a way of, kind of predatory if you look at the age difference like I know it's only three or four years difference but in high school that's a big difference like looking back thinking about like senior guys dating freshmen like fresh out of middle school it kind of weirds me out now at the time you didn't really think much of it but I liked Sam I liked their friend group but I do think that there were some Possibly unhealthy dynamics playing out amongst all the friends within that friend group. Okay. Okay, Allison Stoner. Mo, thank you for that recommendation. I will check out her podcast about narcissistic, narcissistic parents and child stars. Psychology book we could possibly read, You Are Not Alone, The NAMI Guide to Navigating Mental Health by Ken Duckworth. Let me look at that. Oh, well, actually, we've already voted for novel, but I will check that out for um, if we vote for a psychology book next. Okay. Growing your self-esteem, self-worth video coming soon. That's a great idea. You know, it's so unique when it comes to self-esteem, improving your self-esteem. Like everybody has their own personal battle where like interventions need to be really specific, but there are probably some interventions and things I use more than others. And that might be a good thing to to work on like a video that will just say a general guide to loving yourself more. That's a great idea. Okay. Ooh, okay. Ooh, the Midnight Library. Are you guys just looking at my favorites playlist and throwing out these suggestions? Cause you're reading, you're, every suggestion is making me excited. Let's definitely put the Midnight Library on, library on here. Why I think the Midnight Library is a great fit for us is because that book um, is talking about suicidality and depression and regrets, um, but in a very unique, transform transformative, creative way that you have important conversations, but it's also a fun book. That was a five-star read for me. For a long time, that was like absolutely my favorite book. Okay, so tell me, Mary, why do you think The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo 
Hugo would be a good book for our book club with given the mental health themes. I loved that book. It was a five-star read for me, one of my favorites, but I just, I can't remember it that well because I read it a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago now. So remind me if you think that there are any dynamics in there that would read well in a mental health book club. The Midnight Library was okay. I liked it. I loved it actually. Older one, but The Kite Runner. Hmm. You know, The Kite Runner is one of those books I was assigned in school. Yeah, and I actually never read it. I probably did like the Spark Notes. Yeah, I didn't. I don't even think I watched the movie, honestly. Um, but I read this other book called I can't remember it, but it was a great book where she was like reading. Like somebody made a list of books, and this person was reading it while she was grieving, it, and the Kite Runner was on there. Let me, I know the Kite Runner has super high scores, but you guys tell me: is the Kite Runner like really slow? I need to know that for sure, because I'm always worried about that. Is it a really slow book? That's a great suggestion. Okay. Yeah, Eve The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo was a great, great book. And I will totally say I saw the twist coming at the end. I was proud of myself. What about So Be It? I remember reading in the fifth grade and it was pretty great. I've never actually heard of that, Guadalupe. I have to look into that one. Okay. Thanks for keeping me company. Hi, Gugu. You were able to make it. I know that you're always, it's so late for you when we do these, but thank you for joining. I'm sorry that you're dealing with insomnia. We recently just changed out our bed and everything, and my sleep has been so much better. I mean, I've had such a full day today, and I'm not even tired. I have so much energy to hang out with you guys. Okay, there's a lot for me on relationships with Evelyn Hugo with all her husbands and the media impact. She was also in an abusive relationship. That's true. Okay, you guys, so you should see me in a crown. No, I haven't read that. I will check that out. I always love book recommendations. And if you guys are my friends on Goodreads, I know a lot of you like follow me on Goodreads, but I prefer if you friend me on there because I want to see what y'all are reading too. And if you follow me, I can't see what you're reading. I want to be your friend on there. So if you're on Goodreads and you're following me, please friend me. I want to be your friend on there. Oh, the kite runner gave you trauma. It gave you trauma? Hmm. I'm scared, y'all. I'm scared. But I do need to read The Kite Runner. It's just one of those books like I know I need to read it. Let me look at what themes come up for it. Yeah, Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. The Midnight Library. And let's see, The Kite Runner. Right now... I, I'm just looking at the kite runner, the kite runner, and it doesn't even have mental health listed as one of the primary genres. So I'm not sure if that would be a great fit for our book club. Let me look up the seven husbands of, of Evelyn Hugo. That's one of the ones, one of the things I look for. For those of you who are hanging on so we can vote on these books, thank you. I appreciate you. Okay, let's see. What are the genres here? Did I miss it? Oh, yes. Contemporary audiobook, queer, historical fiction. Yeah, I don't know if that one has the things we're looking for either. Now, I'm totally fine reading The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo because I loved that book so much. Um, actually, I, Taylor Jenkins Reid is my favorite author, and I've read every single book she has ever written. Every single book. She's the one who got me back. Oh, whoa. I, I popped back over to the chat, and you guys have this thing popping. Okay. Um, mm -mm -mm. A young girl, like 12 or 13, goes on a quest and basically runs away to find out more about her mom's past. Her mom's disabled, and the girl lives with a woman who has phobia of going outside. Oh, interesting. I think they're going to make a movie series about Seven Husbands. Could you look up the summer, the summary for So Be It? Let's look it up. 
I love you guys throwing all of these suggestions out. It helps me out so much. So be okay. So it's got great ratings. Ah, but it's number one in a series. I kind of try to avoid series. That's why I was worried about the Hunger Games. From a clan touching story, coming a story of a young girl who goes on a cross country journey to discover the truth about her parents. Also, this is one you're talking about where her mentally disabled mother's past, but it isn't it's how Drew lives. I think this might be one I need to read first before I throw it for our suggestions. So let me look up one more option so we can vote on three. Mm -hmm. Eleanor. Mental health. I also loved The Silent Patient. That was a th mystery thriller that I absolutely loved. That's on this list, too. I I don't know how you guys feel about Sally Rooney. Her writing is love it or hate it. I love Sally Rooney's writing. Now, the thing about her stories, I don't really have a plot. It's just people living and struggling through their mental health. But I loved it. So let's look more mental health. Anxious people loved that. Beautiful world, where are you? Loved that. Okay, so it looks like we're really coming down between the Midnight Library and Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. So, oh, oh, oh. I think they're going to make room, so be it. I just added you on Goodreads. You don't have to ask me twice to add you on there. Great. I love how it, why did you rate Know My Name three stars? I thought it was a five-star book, so I'm very curious. Oh, I actually, that was one of the books that we did for this book club. So I talk all about why I rated it that way in the book club. It's still on the channel if you want to click on that one. Um, Cause Secret Life of Bees work. My mom mainly sees so be it. Silent Patient was a good book, so the child among the kind wouldn't take care of the mother. What about the God of Small Things? And I'll express how small, seemingly into their cursed decisions, experience to shame his life. Had to jump off for a little bit, but I love the Midnight Library. Okay, so let's just do those two. Let's do Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine and the Midnight Library. You guys vote on that, and we'll pick between those for our book for next month. And while you guys are doing that, I'm going to look at the date for our next book club. So for those of you who don't know, we've moved from meeting monthly to meeting every other month for the book club. And that is just so that we all have more time to read the book. Um, okay, so our next book club meeting is going to be on February 27th. That is the last Tuesday in February. I typically try to do the last Tuesday, but because we were running into the holidays, that's why we did this one so early this month. Okay. Oh, Catching Fire for a Novel. Is it too late, babe? Can you add it or no? You got to end it and remake it. We'll add catch, Catching Fire too. Because for those, it, right? uh -huh, yeah, end it. And we're going to we're gonna add Catching Fire because we did read The Hunger Games and some people wanted us to continue on in the series with the book club. So I'm going to, and so far it looks like the Midnight Library was winning. Okay. Um, I'm going to add Catching Fire in there. Thank you for that reminder, Ariel, or Ariel, Ariel, so many different ways to pronounce it. Um, and you guys can go ahead and vote between those three, because I really did want three for you to vote for anyway. And some of these other suggestions you guys have given me, I will try to read them before our next meeting so that I can suggest some of them for us to vote on next time. Make sure you're in our Goodreads group on um, our Goodreads group because we have like we like to do like smaller conversations there as a matter of fact we're catching fire um gabrielle i think already put some questions in there for catching fire so once i read it i'm going to go in and answer some of the questions she wrote so the good thing about the book club is you don't have to just wait for me to ask questions if you're reading something 
and you want to ask people questions, you could do that you're on your own. Um, and I'll usually always pop in there and, and give an answer if I've read it or if I have thoughts around it. I love when you all do that. I create a folder for each book that we read and you can go in and do that. Also, if you've missed any of the lives, I have on our group homepage on Goodreads for this book club, you can click on it. So somebody was asking about my thoughts on um, what my bones know, I think. Um, so I have that. You can click on that and see what my thoughts were and why I gave that a three star, why I gave that three stars. Okay, so now we've got a new poll up. So if you already voted, come back, come back, come back. We've got eight people who need to vote again because we've added in a third option. So we've got Catching Fire, which is the second book in the Hunger Games series. I will probably at some point be doing a breakdown of... Um, of the whole Hunger Games series like I did with Twilight. But the difficulty with that is I haven't read the books and I read all the Twilight books multiple times. I don't feel right doing the breakdown just based on movies because so much is left out of movies. So um, Hunger Games, I absolutely loved. And I was like, I was almost mad at myself for waiting so long to read it, but it was amazing. Um, and now, you know, so if you want to read Catching Fire together, we can. Um, Midnight Library. Again, that book is about um, our protagonist is dealing with some suicidality. And she basically gets an opportunity to, let's just say, look at her regrets um, and see what her life could have been like if she would have made different choices. Um, I loved that book. And um, Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. We're looking at a character who I would say presents as though she is on the spectrum. She is, her interactions with people are very different than what we're accustomed to. So she misses a lot of social cues, but I just love the way she sees the world. I think that the way she sees the world, it really makes me question a lot of things that we just take as like, okay, um, or take for granted. Um, and we start seeing a little bit of an obsessive thing happening with her. Uh, but really, I think the most important conversation we'll have around that book will be trauma. Yes. Nah. Um, okay. Yes. And our next book club, thank you and Dosi for adding that will be February 27th at seven o'clock PM Eastern time. You can just put that at the bottom. Okay. Let's see. You guys are voting. I'm so curious which one is going to win. At one point I had this expanded. Oh, there we go. No, I wanted to see it. Oh, wow. So right now the Midnight Library is winning by a lot. I love that book. Okay, so I'll give you guys a few more moments. Okay, so let me see. Any other? Oh, you guys, exciting video I have coming up. I broke down the relational dynamics in Elf. Um, so that is my favorite Christmas movie, favorite, favorite, favorite of all time. So I broke down really Buddy's experience um, coming to New York City and his relationship with his family um, and the relationship he had back in the North Pole. So keep an eye out for that. That'll, that should be coming out this week. So I'm really, really excited about that video. And if I have time, I may also break down Home Alone, um, but I don't know if I'll have time because... I think I was expecting to get Elf out a little bit earlier, but I still may be able to even get it out tomorrow. So we'll see. And I'll probably do a premiere. So just like we're chatting in here for a live, we can join me for the premiere for that one so we can chat in there too. I recognize your names when you come in multiple times. Okay. Let's see. Oh, yay, Rachel. I'm glad that you're excited. I'm so, so excited about that. Yes, I rewatched it. That's one of those ones I have to watch like every year. I think it's the, I personally think Elf might be one of the best Christmas stories ever. Um, I read your mind, girl, I'm the biggest uh, simp for the Home Alone series. What we did, if anyone isn't following me on Instagram, we, and Dosi and I went to a symphony last week or a couple of weeks ago, where the um, Atlanta Symphony Orchestra was actually playing the entire film score along with the movie. And we've gone before for Harry Potter, but this time they even had a live choir. I mean, just the most amazing experience because we love uh, live music. We love 
the orchestra, and then to also have a movie that we loved. It was the best experience. That was one of the first holiday activities that we did. So we just had the best time there. Okay, I've only watched the Peanuts Christmas movie and the Tom and Jerry one. I'm Gen Z. I've never watched Elf. <gasps> You're Gen Z, Guadalupe. I honestly, that is shocking to me. I'm. I honestly thought that you might be even older than me. You just have the comments that you give. You just seem so well lived and mature. Wow. 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 Yes, you have to watch Elf and let me know. Like when I hope you can watch it. it's on Hulu. I think it's also on Max, right? I think for some, it's on both Hulu and Max. So definitely if you haven't seen it before or you need a rewatch, watch it. So that way you can be in time for the video that should be coming out like either tomorrow or Thursday. Wow. Okay. I'm so happy to have like Gen Z in here, you know, it makes me feel a little younger. <laughs> I probably just made myself 10 times older by saying that. But, you know, I think that it's so great to see the expansion of ages in here and the conversations that we're all having to just know that anybody can um, benefit from these conversations. I love that. Well, keep on contributing, Guadalupe. I feel like you have so much wisdom to, to impart on us, even though you're younger. Okay, so let's go ahead and end the poll. And the winner is, as we can all see, wish I could have a drum roll. The Midnight Library. Woohoo! I love this book. Definitely do for a reread. Funny enough, this is actually full circle. I first started this book club back in 2021, before I was really taking it seriously. And I tried to make the Midnight Library our fir first book. Now, at the time, I didn't have anybody in the book club. So <laughs> I didn't have any conversation going whatsoever. So this is a completely full circle moment to now have the Midnight Library be our book of the month, voted on by you guys. And we have almost 500 members on in the Goodreads um, book club. for So that's awesome. Make sure you join there so you can jump in our conversations. All right, you guys, we're almost at an hour and a half. This is the longest live I think I've ever done. You guys are awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you for hanging out with me. My final thoughts on The Parks of Being a Wallflower, five stars for me. I love the format that the story is told in, and I love the lessons we can take from it. And I even came to appreciate the fact that we don't get any closure on who those letters are being written to. Um, because it gives us the opportunity to just kind of fill it in for ourselves. So definitely loved it. How I think, I think I can't remember if it was Gabriella, Sierra, one of y'all OGs in here recommended that we read the perks of being a wallflower. Thank you so much for that suggestion. And I look forward to talking with you guys about the Midnight Library on February 27th, right? That's the date. February 27th, yep, at 7 p.m. That'll be our first meeting in 2024, and I will see you guys there. Make sure that if you have questions or anything you want to talk about, especially if you want your, your comments to be talked about in the live, um, you know, put that in the Goodreads group. Feel free to ask your own questions, respond to people. Building a community of readers that are interested, curious, talking about mental health, family dynamics, that is my dream. So you guys are making my dream come true. I love you guys so, so much, and I'll see you soon. Bye.